Hello, everyone. Um, afternoon. Afternoon. Um, I must get a prompt start, because I don't know if you've noticed on the program that next up is Amanda Spielman, who's the chief inspector. So the idea of being late is kind of a little, making me panic a little bit. So if you've, been on, you know, if you've had an Ofsted inspection, which many of you have, that kind of thing where you planned all night, you're teaching, and you're just waiting to see if the door opens. And she might literally walk in at some point near the start. So if she does, and I kind of panic a little bit, that's what that is. Um, if I introduce myself, um, my name's Alex Quigley. I am an English teacher at Huntington School. Um, and I also lead Huntington Research School. Um, and we're supporting um, teachers and school leaders to actually um, understand evidence, appraise evidence, um, look at their school priorities, um, and actually a lot of the same aims um, of research yet. Um, I'm an English teacher, and this talk has a focus on language and communication and vocabulary. However, this is very much a talk for every teacher. It's not an English teacher who is trying to kind of preach the gospel of literacy. I'm actually quite critical of aspects of whole school literacy, and I think um, I'll touch on some more alternatives um, later on in my talk. Um, this talk is for every teacher, and the title is about 50,000 um, solutions to the problem, the challenges of the new curriculum. I think some of my examples will wait towards GCSE, and I think I apologise for that, but actually it's just the nature of, it's what I'm immersed in on a day-to-day -day basis, so familiarity. Um, but the relevance there to Key Stage 2 and to primary is completely pertinent, and some of the things I talk about, actually the foundations of success start before children get to school in terms of communication vocabulary. Um, in 40 minutes, I won't be able to cover kind of the lifespan of that, but it is for all teachers. Um, I want to start um, with an individual student, and he's a student um, who is in my school, um, a student called David. Um, he's currently in year 11, but last year, uh, so about six months ago now, um, I followed David through the school day, because what we've done as a staff, we talked about, all oh, the new curriculum, it's bigger, it's harder, you know, we've got lots of issues, and children are coming from primary with new language and kind of a different curriculum there, so how are we going to get to grips with all this? And actually, there was a lot of angst and anxiety around the new curriculum, not just English and maths, just across the board, but actually too little specific grasp of the issue and that complexity. And in the, the session description, I talk about shrinking the problem. And I actually hope in this session I articulate that one of the key problems of the new curriculum, right from reception to A-level, is the challenges of communication, of academic language that sometimes we take for granted and that our children, some do and some don't. David is one of the children who will be a school success story. He's not sat his GCSEs, and you know, some of the targets will be spurious, but he will do very, very well. I can, I can be certain of that. And when I followed him through the day, I started in computer science, period one, and they sat down, and the teacher was talking about bitmaps, and, and about a, a language, a code, quite literally about coding, that I didn't understand and David was quite comfortable and familiar. Then, period two, we went to chemistry. I'm line manager of science, so I should know a little bit about it. Um, and they were talking about um, some complex issues and using not just vocabulary, but complex equations. And David was, was able to juggle those and manage those. Period three, after break, and it was a break for me as much as for David or anyone else, was German. I didn't study German at school, and much of the lesson was inscrutable to me. There was some language, uh, it was a topic of friendship, so I could kind of hook my kind of basic grasp of communication to try and understand that. But German was a struggle for me. For David, when I spoke to him at the end of the day, he said that was pretty, an easy lesson as his German lessons go. In the afternoon, it was maths, period four, and... It was, there wasn't a lot of teacher communication, there was just a lot of practice, a lot of 
practice around equations and the students were almost kind of just managing that and talking to the teacher when they needed to. I kind of sat there and didn't really understand what was going on. And then period five, it was a bit of an oasis for me because it was an English lesson and I felt very comfortable and it was all very familiar and the language was my language. What struck me at the end of the day, I spoke to David and he said, yeah, it was a fine day, you know, he had a bag full, he had homework to take home, etc. He was fine. I was exhausted. I really struggle with the day. I'm not someone who struggles on a daily basis because I'm doing a job I'm very experienced at. And actually, he was speaking five languages in one day. He was code switching, the academic code of computer science and then over to science and then to German. But there was quite literally multiple languages that he was manipulating. And then he, at break time and lunchtime, I didn't stand next to him. That would have been a bit weird. But I'm sure he changed his code again to speak to his friends, that everyday language. So in his given day, he's just really dexterous with his communication. And I wasn't. And I felt really tired. My back was sore because of the plastic chairs as well. I was looking for empathy from David from that. He wasn't giving me any. Um, but it really struck me that the GCSEs were challenging, but they weren't so challenging for him, they were really challenging for me because I could not understand the academic codes that those teachers were using. And there's a fundamental issue with how we talk to our children every day and then the texts they go on to read are highly academic and what happens over time is children like David manage things, they might have some stresses, they might have workload issues like we all do, but they get on and they flourish. And they go on to make choices about university or professions. But there are a lot of children, and they are absent from my talk here, but they're in our classrooms who don't grasp that academic code. And there are many more that just go hidden through the school day. And hopefully by the end of this session, there's some word consciousness from you in the sense of the challenge of communicating to year five children, year six children, year seven, 10, 11, on a fundamental level. And I was surprised on that day I followed David about how little I could communicate, how little I could grasp. And you know what? I was very confident that there were a lot of students who were in my position, a lot of novices who were struggling. So when we talk about the bigger curriculum, and in history, that might, you know, a shorthand for that is going from 100 years of British history to 1,000 years. And teaching the Norman Conquest brings up a whole host of problems around language and knowledge and communication that are new. But we've got to get to grips with that problem. Otherwise, children like David will coast through school and they'll do very well. But it's the children who fall off. And those, you know, we talk a lot about gaps uh, in attainment, but that gap is a communication gap. We are not speaking to a lot of the children in our school. And as a teacher myself, I'm trying to be more, to more recognize that on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, and be really careful about my communication. So that's the argument I'm posing. And what David has, and I think vocabulary is a good proxy and a good simplification, although it is a simplification, for the learning in the curriculum. But David Crystal and other researchers have given this um, notion that if you've got a vocabulary of around 50,000 words, then you've got enough words in the bank, you're word wealthy, you can tackle school, you will flourish, and you will go on to make choices that are crucial beyond school. And you can stand in a courtroom on the right side of the podium and speak confidently. You can talk in any profession or a university seminar. If you don't have those words, if you don't have that word wealth, then you never make it. You never succeed in school and you don't have a voice beyond that. We often hear, you know, these kind of some very famous people who didn't do well at school and they were successful. People like Alan Sugar, Richard Branson, Jeremy Clarkson, every year on Results Day, talks about how badly he did, and I'm not surprised, because he's arrogant. But actually, they are complete outliers. Most children who didn't do well in school 
don't do well in life. Most children who don't do well in school have more health problems. They don't have a wealth. Their children have issues with accessing school and so on and so on. And the cycle of social immobility that the government is protesting they're dealing with carries on and on for generations. And it's, to simplify that, it's a gap of vocabulary and it's a gap of communication. And we need to make that, a, we need to be aware as teachers about that gap and close it in our classrooms. And I'll just pose a couple of examples here. And I've done a lot over the summer of looking in textbooks and GCC textbooks and looking at comprehension texts at primary. Pluck this from a chemistry text. I've since looked at the physics GCC textbook and that's even harder. And the challenges there, I've spent some training sessions unpicking that. There's lots to unpick. On a superficial level, you can see whether you're a scientist or not, that there's a lot of complexity and a lot of complex language. If you can't have access to that vocabulary, you cannot understand the deep concepts that lie within it. Vo vocab is the label for the things, but if you can't grasp the labels, you can't get to understand the thing. And in science, which I'll talk about later on, the labels aren't just words either. It's more complex than that. They're dealing with lots of different codes of communication. This, um, for primary teachers in the room, is rather infamous. You can, if you look up the dead dodo text, it's the one that the tests and everyone else reported about children crying in the exam. It was the third text of three in a reading comprehension text. And when, I, when this first came out, I was thinking, right, well, not my year sevens, I was thinking of my year 10 group and how well they would access that text. Now, I think there are some useful ways to start looking at that text because at this moment in time, it's just a hard text and we know that. I think as teachers, we need to start unpicking a difficult text because every lesson we go into, regardless of subject, A's or phase, we are thinking about how we communicate what we're trying to help our children learn. And the texts have to be communicated skillfully. Just taking the photocopy from the textbook or taking the scheme from the PowerPoint never quite works, and we know that. Now, you might know about this, so um, I'll mention the book later on. I think it's a very valuable and important book on vocabulary, bringing words to life. But Isabel Beck and her team, they're Americans, they talked about three tiers of language, and I think We've all been to school. We've got an intuitive sense of what she means in science. We're often talking about tier three words. So a lot of those words on the previous slide are tier three. What's really interesting and where the academic code adds layers of complexity that we are often blind to are tier two words. And they are words that are used across the disciplines that we just take for granted. And words like assess and area, etc., they move and they shift. And when David goes from each classroom, he needs to see how they shift and how they move. And you need word depth. You need a lot of knowledge about vocabulary and the, and the language to grasp these. So I think this is a helpful proxy. And when we take this, and I've taken this as used it as a tool for teachers, we should hold the text we're using for that lesson and have an awareness of that. And then when you go back to this text, you can start to unpick it a little. And you can start to think about how we teach slightly differently. I'm talking about slightly modifying our teaching. And you start to think, right, well, what are the tier three subject specific words? What are the tier two words, those general academic words that we use all the time? And actually, when you look at those, you might think, right, geography, geographers in the room, um, drought, Part Oasis, Mauritius, Mudflats, you've got a tier three specific area around geographical terminology, but then you've got words like much ridiculed, rehabilitate, receding, that are general academic words. Now, if, you're really, if you get really word conscious, then you could argue that every one of those words are tier two, because children are sitting in an exam reading this text agnostic about the subject. It's not a geography lesson. 
It's a reading comprehension task. There's a huge amount of geographical knowledge that sits within that text. It's why children find nonfiction so difficult. And one of the books I recommend later on, The Reading Mind by Dan Willingham, he talks about a crucial period. It's grade four in America, but it's year five in England, where we start to shift away from the narratives and the stories we tell young children. And we start to move towards non-fiction texts, information texts. And they have more tier three words, tier two words, than narrative fiction. And what starts to happen, almost in a hidden way, from year four and year five onwards, is children start to read non-fiction texts. And the day that I sat with David, all day he was reading non-fiction, even in the English lesson, all day, they are more complex. They've got more specific vocabulary, more dense academic vocabulary. And, and one of my hypotheses, it's not proven, that I think a problem with transition is that children come from year six, and yes, they've done different assessments and everything else, but they come to year seven, and they go away from that single teacher, but they go to multiple different subjects, all with information, dense information texts, with their own codes and genres and styles and vocabulary. And those children who are quite successful in year two and year three and year four, and who still quite successful in year seven around telling a story or writing a story, start to flounder. But as teachers, we don't quite see it. And I think that's really important. We should start looking at where children start to struggle. Do they start to struggle in science in key stage three? Because what they're reading is so different to anything, pretty much, they've read in their lives. And we've got to then negotiate that. I think vocabulary and awareness of communication is more important in science than it is in an English lesson. And that's a bit paradoxical. I've sat, as in my role as a school leader, I line manage science, I've sat in a lot of science lessons with far too little subject knowledge to be doing that really, but I did, I sat in science lessons. And actually, the, the level of language and communication is so high, it's no surprise that the hardest GCSEs are the sciences. And that's just one aspect of science, but it's one we should be aware of. And I'll just pose this, and I'll just give you 30 seconds with the person next to you. What percentage of words for a given text do you think a child needs to know to comprehend that text unsupported? 30 seconds. Think of that answer. Okay. Okay, I've got to be quick. Ofsted are watching. Got to be quick. Okay. Now, hold the percentage in your mind. Hold that percentage. I'm not going to tell you yet. Hold that in your mind. Okay. This is a passage from science that has blocked out some words. What you have there is 75%. If you thought 75% was enough for comprehension, you might be revising that upwards. Okay? I'll come back to that one. That is 95%, give or take. Though I've cheated a little. It's not quite 95%, but it virtually is. Okay? Now, someone just said in the crowd, that, well, it, it's important which word you're blacking out. And that's exactly true. What I've blacked out there is the key word in the whole passage. So when a child is sitting there in science and you're taking for granted they're reading that chapter, that page on energy or whatever else it is, if they don't know one word sometimes, that can really trip up their knowledge. Does anyone know what word is omitted? Graduated now? Someone up? Calibration, yeah, who said that hand up? Okay, well done, sir, Mac. Okay, the answer is calibration. Okay, now... People in the room who are scientists, who've just got or a fantastic general, are you a scientist? Uh, yes. Okay, okay, that's cheating, okay. <laughs> um, but time and again, I've asked that question and a lot of people don't know because we don't have a lot of subject knowledge in that area. If you ask a room of scientists, you know, it's a different proposal. But that word calibration is quite important 
Because what I'm not asking you to do on Monday morning is transform your teaching and chuck out schemes of learning. What I'm asking you to do is think about and recalibrate slightly how you communicate and think very carefully about the knowledge of the children in front of you and how well they're understanding the words that you are communicating, the academic language you are using and what they are reading. So calibration is quite an important concept in this general way. I'm using it. So I think this is really useful for me. It kind of boils it down. And it doesn't work for every single text. If you are an English teacher, then, and a child is reading A Christmas Carol, they might have lower than 95%. But because you can omit a sentence and still make sense of the story. But in a lot of non-fiction and geography texts and science texts, if you are missing one or two words, you are flummoxed, you are stuck, you do not understand. So that's quite useful. When was the last, I posed this rhetorical question, don't answer. When was the last time you read a text where on every page there were quite a few words you didn't understand? What did you feel about that? What did you do about that? And I suspect you brought a lot of prior knowledge, you might have researched, you might have used a dictionary. One of the things that Beck and her team and lots of others have replicated, children use dictionaries really badly. They're not written very well, thesauruses are worse. Okay? They use dictionaries badly because what do you need for a dictionary? Lots of word knowledge. And if you're a novice, you don't know which definition is the right definition. So you see lots of funny examples. So we can't even rely on simple tools. We have got to be very aware of that. When we're saying the GCSE is harder, it's harder because of that. When we're saying the reading exam at Key Stage 2 is harder, one of the reasons that it's harder because of that. And it should make us stop and think and be more aware. So David, he is carrying a bag full of stuff like that. Lots of different texts, and he's grappling with those quite comfortably. But I could give you a list of children every single year group, and the list is far too long for children who don't have the capacity to easily grasp a lot of that knowledge. And on one level, it's a vocabulary and communication issue. Yes, it's memory, it's background knowledge in some subjects, it's numeracy, etc. But on a fundamental level, it's the words we know and use and understand in classrooms. And I think this sums it up, and I think it's a very useful that it's not perfect, it's not everything. Words are not the, you know, the kind of encapsulate knowledge and understanding, but it's a very good proxy for a lot of general knowledge and a lot of understanding. I would pose that question. How many times have you taught a lesson thinking very carefully about that? About the words being selected, about the words being taught, about the words children may or may not know. We're all really busy. It's hard to do that. I think as teachers and as departments and as phases and as schools, we need to think more about that. And testing and assessment's got a part to play in that. But teaching and how we talk fundamentally has to be aware of this. And a concept I want to use is called word consciousness. And it's actually what I've been describing. This sense that you are aware of words. You are aware that you go from computer science to another lesson and the words might have slightly different meanings. Because they do. I can't remember the word now, it's really frustrating me, but there's a word in computer science that's got a different meaning in science and maths and then a different meaning in general use. It takes word consciousness to be aware of the words you don't know. And as teachers, we need that as much as the children need to be aware about the words they're reading. The problem is, and where a lot of attainment gaps in our school start really early before children get to school, is that a lot of children haven't been brought up in a language-rich environment. They have not been brought up reading books. There's really depressing statistics around the average number of books in homes. There is um, evidence, Hart and Risley, and then lots of follow-up studies like the Lena um, recording program where they took 65,000 hours of recordings of preschool children, and they recognised that in some families they were in language-rich environments, in others they weren't. The, day, the first day children get to school can be a very different experience. And what seems to happen implicitly 
we start to think that some children are the academic type. And that, oh, they're, they're a middle class kid, they've got supportive parents, you know. And they just seem to get on, and we seem to look at them slightly differently. And then there are other children from deprived backgrounds and whatever label we are using that we recognise that uh, they're not academic. And then over time, they're naughty. And then we try and find an alternative curriculum for them. And we try and kick them out of school. And they never quite get back, back in school. And actually, what we need to really focus on is that some of those children don't have the language to describe their world. They come to our lessons without that wealth of words. There's a study, um, the British cohort study from 1970, which has tracked a huge number of British children and, and started the assessment when they were five years of age, and it's continuing now, and there's a millennium study that's replicated that too. And in those studies, they found strong correlations between the words and vocabulary of children at five and then the life, their experience, their jobs, their qualification, basically all of those factors that we label as success beyond school. So it's a problem that starts early. And it's a problem for every single teacher, not just for English teachers or literacy teachers or those teachers in the early years looking to do learning to read. And I think there are some strands. I think we can start to get underneath it and we can start to do something about it and plan around it and adjust our teaching for it. Word consciousness isn't just a theory. You can start to get it in practice. So reading more actively. Now that is about the child thinking very differently. I was at a brilliant primary school in Derby the other day and they were using different coloured glasses and all kinds of things to get children really aware of what they're reading and how they're comprehending or not. My daughter, she has got this thing in their school where they um, do that with their fingers and they use check specs for when they've undertaken their writing and their checking. By the time we get to secondary school, all that stuff is laughed off, you know, as kind of, you know, primary school, childish, etc. What it is, is fundamental understanding of how you read and the basic understanding of language. And I think in secondary schools, we don't understand enough about how children learn to read, but then crucially, how you read to learn. And I see too many lessons in science and geography and computer science where the fundamental understanding of the subject will be lost because there's not that awareness. And it needs to be part of the new curriculum and it needs to be part of our training. And I'm not blaming teachers here. I've gone 15 years in the profession and I've never had a training session about how children learn to read. I've had to go out and find those things out and teach it and learn from doing it. There is about communication different subjects. I'll talk about that a little bit later on. I, I've been critical of whole school literacy, literacy across the curriculum, because it usually fails because teachers of maths and science don't think it's for them, because usually the strategies aren't for them. Drop everything and read, for me, my high profile reading, but what does a science teacher think of that when they're really pushed to teach their massive curriculum? We've got to be thinking really carefully about how we read differently in different subject domains. Because if you're a historian, reading sources, you're corroborating, you're looking for bias. If you're in English, you're looking for themes and ideas. If you're in science, you're looking for logic and you're looking for evidence and different things. We're doing different jobs in different subjects. That's the academic code we need to identify. Now, another one of those was morphology and etymology, word parts and the history of words. Okay? Yes, I'm an English teacher, so you could argue that you know, I, I love words. That's, you know, that's my thing. And yes, I do. I'm unashamed about that. But actually, there's a lot of substantial knowledge around vocabulary and word parts that helps in science and in maths and in, across the curriculum. So I take that. Does anyone know? the Latin words that actually underpin AM and PM. Small number of people. Okay? I'm not advocating we bring back Latin, although it wouldn't be a bad thing. I'm no traditionalist, but it wouldn't be. What I'm advocating 
is that we need a word depth, a word knowledge. Because, you know, this is happening all around us. So if you did know the answer, you can pat yourself on the back. Oh. Now, when you look at anti, uh, that should be an E, apologies, and post, actually you look at prefixes. There are around 20 key prefixes in our language. And about four of them, like un, re, are in most of the words that we use. So we can deliberately teach a small number of prefixes and help children grow their vocabulary. Just that post is something we take for granted. But then if you look at this, and it's from a brilliant website called Membean, um, just look at those words and how many words connect across the curriculum and how the roots of those words are the same, how the prefixes and suffixes are the same. And that's the type of word consciousness that I want to encourage. We don't have to stop teaching our subject. Language and communication is our subject. Otherwise, it is blocked, and only children like David can access it. And I really like this as well for spelling. I think we've wrapped ourselves in knots around spelling because we don't know how to teach it. Now, I've not got, I'd need a bit more time if we're going to talk about how to teach spelling, but. We can know some answers. So why do children spell like that? Phonetic, it's how it sounds. Actually, we could tell them an interesting, memorable story that when middle-aged scribes, not middle-aged as in 40-odd, scribes from the Middle Ages, when they were writing, they were writing in minims, these little, you know, little flecks. And actually, words like this were unintelligible because they were just a series of straight lines, virtually. So the letter E became really commonly used in, in the ends of words to make them more visible in scripts back then. Now, is that going to make children write differently better? Actually, I think we'd be surprised by how many hooks and how much knowledge we can support children with to be aware about the language around them. I had year seven yesterday, and they've gone off, and they need to find out where the word coffee is from. Because it's one of those things we take for granted. When you know where the word coffee is from, and I'm not going to tell you because you're going to have to find out yourselves. Discovery learning, it's fantastic. Uh, Tom Bennett told me that. Okay. But actually, you gain knowledge, not just word knowledge. You gain knowledge of the world. And etymology and morphology should be part of an approach to spelling. I haven't got time, but I'd argue for all those other things as well. But we need substantive structure about how to teach spelling if we're going to do it well. And it comes down to, it's not just spelling, I think that's a minor part of communication. I am talking about the communication in every classroom every single day. It was just as valid in the old curriculum as the new, but it's more pronounced when history is a thousand years, you have more academic words and quite literally archaic words that children need to know. And we need to break that down. So what is academic vocabulary? And I would unpick all this Nagy and Townsend um, words as tools is the study. And it's really accessible, actually. I think it's quite useful. Um, I'm trying to write something a bit more accessible than that. But they've all got a high proportion of Latin and Greek words and derivations, which is good. Because it means in science, we can be really consistent. And when you learn prefixes and certain suffixes and, and, and roots like photo, you don't just learn photosynthesis, you learn a whole wealth of words and a whole breadth of knowledge. The one I'm interested in is normalisation. And you just unpack that a little bit. So our children talk, you know, they might be sweating. And we might try and lift their language a bit into, oh, you perspired. Perspiration is the normalisation of perspire. Now, the word perspiration is not used in everyday talk, but we understand what it means. But when I say perspiration, everyone's thinking, right, well, that's quite a few things, isn't it? That's a, that's a process. It's quite complex. But that's useful because in science, we can use a few of those words and compact a lot of information. So fundamentally, academic language is often big words because it's got more prefixes and more suffixes. But it's words that are more dense with meaning, that they've got, yeah, more stuff in. And we need to know that and understand that. And just an example here, which I think is quite useful. I'm not saying we should have children talking like that bottom example, 
But we need to be aware that if they're writing or if they're reading, then that difference is key and it's happening all day. Children like David do that instinctively. Lots of children don't. We need to bridge that gap. An example here I talked earlier, energy. Children use the word energy before they get to school. It means a whole set of things. Then they get to science and they're flummoxed because energy is represented in lots of different codes and it's very academic and it's hard for them to grasp. And if we're an expert science teacher, we might sometimes take that for granted and we need to be really word conscious about that. Otherwise, fundamental aspects of science will be misunderstood. And I think there is a, a, this sits on the likes of the work of Beck and Marzano, that I think we need to start addressing vocabulary and looking at words deliberately and teaching explicitly as we communicate. So my um, little focus is seek. We need to start selecting the words we teach. We can't teach all the words. One theorist labelled it the spitting in the ocean notion. There are over, you know, there's over a million words. We can't do that. We can teach two or three hundred words in an academic year across different areas, and that adds a whole wealth of knowledge. And it gives them the mental Velcro, the hooks, to learn new knowledge, too. And we need to, be, we need to get under that. We need to be able to very simply explain a new word. I will pose this question to you. How do you teach a new word? I bet everyone does it differently. And there are issues under it around how we do it, friendly definitions, multiple examples, etc. My next point, how do we then dig under it? I know my history teachers are saying, yeah, but I've got to get through this topic by tomorrow. Don't give me your word business. But actually, if they're going to remember it and understand it, they need to have that word business because it's the history business. And then consolidate, not just tests. Weekly word tests, I, I'm, I'm for testing, I've written um, an article not too long ago on the Chem website about tests, they're valuable, they're useful, but if we don't teach, we're just testing and retesting, there's a difference. And consolidation and repetition are important for deepening word knowledge, so we had word depth. So that is, we need to have our approach, we need to be explicit about it and learn about it, and we need to start assessing it in the classroom. There are standard assessments. My school, I'm not, I'm not going to name the, the, advert, um, the assessment people, but they're plastered everywhere today. Um, we're doing the new group reading test because we want to know how well do our year 11s read, our year 9s. We are testing year 7, year 9, year 11. We're working on vocabulary and communication. We're doing standardised tests. But we're also doing classroom tests. This next test is one that I used last year before I taught um, poetry. I knew the poems were hard, but I didn't know what words they knew or not. So I just gave this simple test. One, it, took, it wasn't you know, for something to me to standardise, it was for me to understand how I need to teach next. Okay? This is about responsive teaching, not testing in the notion of you know, crying children reading an exam paper. And this is our focus as a whole school, as a whole school because it's a, a focus for every teacher, because it's an important integral aspect for every child. And I will challenge any teacher in school who thinks it's not. I'm not one of those SLT, I'm quite nice about it, and I train people as well. And I go back, and that not every, ch every child has that code like David. In fact, most don't. It's our job to give children that word wealth, because they won't have it, and a lot of children from backgrounds that we know are difficult, have a harder job of that word wealth, so we need to think about how we do it. One of the things, we need to know more. We're a spectacularly undertrained profession, so we need to know more and read more. We don't just come and listen to me. You should be very critical of what I've just said. You should read more about it. I've just quickly colour-coded that. The stuff in red gives a good grounding in reading. The stuff in green are quite practical and accessible. The stuff in blue is about subject-specific literacy, disciplinary literacy. And that is more effective than general literacy because we don't learn in this general way. When you're in school, predicting in science is different to predicting in English, in history, and everything else. So general comprehension 
is the strategy is there, but we need to have it on a disciplinary level. So we need to know and do literacy better. Um, and I'm going to um, plug a book. I'm writing a book called Closing the Vocabulary Gap. It'll be out in good bookstores some point next year, um, early next year. But I actually think, as a teacher, I need the theory and the practical strategies for it. Okay? And if you want to contact, um, you can get my email. And there are some blogs about it on my website. But I've been busy writing the book. So I'm going to release a lot of the blogs over the next few months to try and support teachers to do this well. Because what I'm, I've been teaching English for 15 years. No one told me any of this stuff. So if you're teaching science, you know, how are you expected to do that? We need better support and we need to train and understand it better. Thank you for listening.